Describing Viva Pinata to anyone is a bit weird. Very brightly coloured um, garden simulator. Uh, a gardening game where you had to look after pinata characters or little cute animals in a garden and kind of like uh, become friends with them and, and kind of farm in a way. The player uh, attracts, uh, befriends and keeps a host of papery creatures in their garden. It's just almost a garden of chaos that you have to try and uh, corral and control in your own special way by, and customising it into, into your own image. It was a six-page document that Tim Stamper had written. The story I always remember is he talked about a, uh, a hawk moth that he found, a hummingbird hawk moth that he found in his garden. And he'd, he'd just seen it one day when he was out. It was lovely and sunny, shining on a flower, and this really strange creature was hovering above one of the flowers and he identified it and then he looked about what sort of things he would need to make more of those appear in his garden and that was the idea for the whole game. It's just kind of nature's, nature's food chain and life cycle so it's kind of like can we, can we turn that into, into a fun game? We thought we'd be able to work on a kind of a mobile device of some sort um, you know with this idea starting with you know nothing and this one seed and then you know ending up with a whole, a whole sort of sort of menagerie of, of, of animals and stuff. Microsoft had a device called um, a pocket PC which was like this little kind of handheld shrunk down PC device which we thought was uh, would be an ideal platform it was portable it had sufficient power uh, and we could do all these ideas of how the pinatas moved around um, but the pocket PC was never to be and we kind of moved it onto Xbox which gave us the uh, obviously the graphical fidelity and the grunt to make it look awesome. We certainly spent some time trying to work out what the pinata should look like. I was tasked with trying to come up with a style that would bring everything together. Um, and so there's lots of ideas about them being toys or being kind of like a soft kind of ragdoll things. Um, or even just kind of like a, a generic cartoon uh, looking thing. But we want, what we wanted to do was something that made it all feel like a family. I really liked um, some of the graphics and artwork around Luch doors. And so I got this whole kind of Mexican thing kind of bubbling in my head at the time. And then realised that if we turn these characters into piñatas, um, it would gel the entire world together. So the, the, um, the lizard is a piñata and the horse is a piñata, even though they're a different species and a different thing, it, it still kind of gelled it all together. It was quite clear almost immediately that it was going to have a better home on a, on a bigger console that allowed us to do more of the animal behaviour things that we wanted. Because I think the first time I got my hands on it, it was still quite early. There was an awful lot of grass and there were some bunnies, which I always enjoy. Um, but my residing memory of that was the fact that you could, you could mate piñata at that point to, to create their offspring, but the mating code wasn't exactly solid. We really, really wanted the idea that, that the animals behaved in a natural way, but we had to find ways for us to explain it to people that didn't just make us seem like we were filthy perverts. So. <laughs> What we came up with was, uh, was the romance dance. People just loved those dance routines and it was perfectly charming and nobody, you know, we didn't really have any problems with people having, with having animals reproducing all over their screen. <laughs> the artist Neil Price said, look, why don't, I've got a great idea. Every romance dance, we could have a different style of music. And I was like, yeah, that's great. And I, I suddenly thought, just a minute, that's 60 animals? That's gonna be not, so we had like 20 seconds of like, dance music or ballroom dancing or metal or punk. And we had tons of fun making the noises for the animals. Like I did tons of them, I can't even remember. 60 animals or something like that. Initially we started looking at real animal noises, but it, it just felt wrong. We suggested that the people on the team just took animals and then made noises for them. We had all the animations in, in ready to go, so we could just come up to the music department, sit and watch the animations and try and make any type of noise that we thought would fit. <laughs> So after the first game, it was proposed that we were going to do a DS version of the game, which just seemed like insanity. It just seemed crazy to try and cram that huge game into such a small device. And um, 
we gave it to the team we had here, our internal uh, handheld team. And um, we kind of forgot about it. And then a few months later, I pretty much stuff was coming into the studio and we, and we were approving it. And it, it appeared, this, this version, this DS version of our enormous game that we'd struggled to get going on an Xbox uh, 360 and get all the features we wanted. And they pretty much had it feature complete on a much smaller, much more reduced handheld. Um, it said they did just an incredible job. So a bunch of the work we'd done kind of rolled straight into the next game. Uh, it gave us a leg up so that we could start immediately working on the sequel. We had this big discussion about whether we should try and squeeze everything that we wanted into six months and create some DLC, or should we try and create some time, like give ourselves 18 months and create a full sequel. At the time we wanted different environments, the deserts we wanted, underwater stuff we were talking about kind of having a kind of a whole expanding the universe of pinatas to be a lot wider so it just seemed like a, a natural thing to do and as i say no one told us not to so we we rolled straight into it we want to carry on to make the this the best that it can be so um yeah i, I think pinata 2 was pretty much driven out of developer passion i'm really proud of the score i'm right the music that i'm really proud of it i thought i did a good job on that one Bedtime Story from Viva Pinata 2. It's on my website, that one. Uh, that was my favourite. It was the last piece that we, we, we recorded in Prague. It was a really emotional tearjerker for me. And that, that one has really always been my favourite track, I think. It still is still on stuff to this day. And I remember I had to go, the recording finished, and the, the, the guy said to me, you should go out to the orchestra, thank the orchestra. And I kind of went onto the podium and went, you know, you've all played so. <laughs> and just burst into tears like that. There was all of these games over here, kind of all kind of brown and green and blue and then over here was like pinata it's like bright and lively and full of colors uh, and offered a a very very different type of game to what was available people really took it to heart and we got reports back of some really interesting things people playing the game and then doing things in the real world that were to do with our game and one of those was um and was fairly widely reported at the time was a guy that proposed to his future wife through our game and he organized a garden um, he used the ring item that could be made inside inside the game and he'd, um, he'd invited her to a, a match that they shared together and he, said, he sent a crate I think over with the ring inside and the marriage and the message was a, a marriage proposal the end result really happy I couldn't I couldn't pick one thing that I thought you know, was a favourite. It's just the whole thing was just it was a, again another really great game to have made. The market's changed quite a lot now, where more different games and slightly more unusual games that seem to be far more accepted. So I think there's something to pick up in, in a package full of lots of rare games. I think it'll be it'll be well thought of and, and it'll be a little a little gem of, of kind of oddness. I think people like Viva Vignata. It's a much deeper game than than people think because it had that cutesy rare bit on the top of it, but underneath it was pretty complicated. Hopefully, there'll be uh, people that have played it before will kind of rediscover the, uh, the, the kind of charm that the, uh, the garden had. But I think hopefully there'll be a, a, a kind of a new set of players that will kind of hopefully appreciate the, the kind of being in a, in a really special world.